Welcome to another Cloudonaut Plus video. This time we are going to talk about a service that uh, received a couple of new features in the last um, months and the service is called EventBridge. So this is going to be a refresher. So before we start, a quick recap, what is EventBridge? So EventBridge is a service where you can send events into the so-called event bus. And if you don't create an event bus, then there is a default event bus in each AWS account that is used. And within an event bus, you can have so-called rules and a rules matches on the content of the event. The content is always a JSON document. And if such a rule is um, matching against an event, targets can be executed and you can have, have up to five targets for a rule. So for example, a target could be a Lambda function um, you could invoke an SSM action or you can also uh, call an API gateway REST API. There's a bunch of other things that you can invoke actually. So there are lots of target types available. So that is EventBridge in a nutshell. And lots of AWS services publish events to uh, EventBridge. And by the way, EventBridge is formally uh, was formerly known as CloudWatch Events. It was then rebranded to EventBridge. So you will get all kinds of event in EventBridge by default that AWS publishes like um, health events, but also CloudTrail um, events and many, many other events, uh, lots of services integrate into EventBridge. So what are the limitations? So that's my, at least that's what I find most interesting with most of the AWS services. So a message can be up to 256 kilobyte in size in event. So that's the maximum. There is no order guarantee. So the order you send events is not necessarily the order you receive them. And the guarantee uh, for delivering events is a so-called at least once delivery, which means the event will be delivered once or multiple times if things go wrong. And also something that I found interesting in when comparing EventBridge to SNS, which I did in a blog post, and this will also be released this week, is that there's no encryption at rest, which is a problem for uh, certain workloads. So what are the new features? First, content filtering, which allows us to have more, I would say, rich filter rules um, um, compared to what we had before. We have a schema registry where um, we can store schema of events, but we can also infer the schema of events by looking at what's coming into the event bus. Um, we have now dead letter queues and retry policies. So if the target cannot invoke the action, we can actually deal with this problem before it was just like skipped. And last but not least, this is one of my favorite new features is replay in archival. So you can capture all the events and at any time you can then replay specific events into your system. So for example, if you deploy the change that uh, corrupted your database, you can just rerun all the events um, in that period. So let's start with the first uh, new feature. It's called content filtering. And I have a real world example here for you that I use to subscribe to events from ECR image scanning. So I'm only interested uh, in, for example, high severity or critical um, scan findings. And what we do here is uh, in the first line, we specify that we only want to receive events from um, Elastic Container Registry, AWS.ECR. We also say we are only interested in the event type ECR image scan. And then we go into the payload of the event, which is the details. Um, and then this is kind of a nested structure. So we have the finding severity counts um, object. And within that we have four different severity levels, for example, for critical. Um, a number and the thing here is that critical uh, is not set to zero if there are no critical findings. If there are no critical findings, it just disappears. So that's why I say, okay, if it, if it does not exist, then still match this rule. And if it exists and if it's a number, it must be bigger than zero. And so the next one would be matching the high severity thing and the medium severity findings and so on and so forth. So that's what you can do now. So we have the exists rule and we have the numeric rule. Um, we have a couple of others. We have the prefix rule, which works with strings. And uh, obviously the string has to start with this specific value. And we also have kind of the negation. We have the anything but rule. So for example, here I say, okay, um, I'm only interested in when events where the state is not pending, for example. So 
that's pretty cool. So it was not possible before to have those kind of richer uh, filters. Um, you can um, now um, formulate more complicated logic. There's still lots of limitations where you run into. It's not a programming language. I mean, it's just a couple of options that we have, but it's much better than what we had before. So let's uh, look into schema registries. And I have a demo for you um, where I show you how this feature works. So let's switch into the AWS console. Um, so we have to look into the event bridge service. So let me open that here quickly. And what I already created here uh, is a event bus. So you can see the default event bus, which is always created by AWS. And we also have um, the cloud and out event bus. So that's the one that I created. And if you click here, you see that schema discovery is actually started, which means it is running. So that's what you have to kind of configure on the event bus side. And now we can look into um, what um, schemas we actually have discovered. So we are interested not in the AWS events, we are interested in our own uh, events. And as you can see, there's one um, event type discovered by schema discovery and it's the ping event. And that's what I actually send every minute into this event bus. And if you open that, um, you will see kind of a um, JSON schema notation of how this event looks like. And what I'm interested in is the, so that's the details section. So every ping has a random attribute and it has a time TS, the timestamp attribute. So random is of type double, TS is of type in 64. So that's kind of the information that um, event bridge automatically discovered for us. So that's pretty nice. You could use that A to get an understanding of what actually is sent into the event bus. So if like many like teams are sending stuff into the event bus that could help to kind of discover what's going on here and what is available. Um, there's no enforcement or anything like this here. Um, so you can still send whatever you like into the event bus. It doesn't have to match against any of those uh, um, schemas. So it's, it's more uh, like for client side validation. So you could use the schema to validate before you publish to event bus, but it's not enforced in the service itself. So that's something to keep in mind. So don't rely on it in terms of um, input data validation, for example. So let's go on. Now um, we looked at schema registry is actually a pretty simple feature and you pay for uh, the discovery feature if you use that. So the next feature that I want to highlight is um, that letter queues and retry policy. So that's new for event bridge. So how does it look like? So if you have a rule defined and within that rule, you can have multiple targets that I mentioned, so up to five. For each target, you can define, okay, what's the dead letter queue? That letter queue is just an SQS queue where the, um, the queue policy allows the event service to publish a message to. And then you can also configure the retry policy, which basically defines how often a retry is allowed to happen and what's the maximum age of an event. So for example, you can say this should not be retried more than three times and event should not get, not get older than 60 seconds. So for example, that's an, um, like the options that I used. And now if uh, event bridge cannot invoke the Lambda function, you will get this retry. So that's how it works. And this works with all of the uh, target types. So if um, event bridge cannot invoke the AWS service, you will um, get a retry or not lose the event. And you have some control over how things work. So let's look into how this works again. Um, I have, oh, let's start with the event bridge rule that I actually created. And let's switch to the cloud and out event bus. And as you can see, this is also a new, new feature, but it's not really interesting. There are now two, type of, two types of rules. One is called the managed um, rule type. So that's created by AWS, you cannot change it. And then there's the standard type. So that's what you actually create and where you can change things. So you can see um, there are actually two managed rules here. One is for schema discovery and the other one is for event archival, which I show you next. So this is kind of how they implement it. It's, it's, it's kind of visible. Uh, for you, but you cannot modify or delete it accidentally. That's kind of blocked because of the type. So let's look into my rule that I created. Um, so um, what I do here is I subscribe to all the events where the detail type is ping and the source is cloud and out, and that matches with what I'm sending on the other side. So 
um, that will also then um, match with the schema that we discovered before, like the ping, the ping schema. Um, and if you look into the target that I configured, which is the Lambda function, you can see now that I have here the retry policy configured and also my dead letter queue. So that letter queue is an SQS queue. So to look into um, the dead letter queue, we have to open up the SQS service. And here you see um, my dead letter queue. And one thing to understand here is that this is really only kicks in if EventBridge is not able to reach out to the Lambda service. So that's the only error that is actually captured and, and this is the only reason why something could end up in the dead letter queue. So things like rate limits, permission errors, uh, or service errors in Lambda. So that could all be causes for uh, something that shows up in the dead letter queue. So what you want to do is you want to monitor the dead letter queue. And there's one metric that, that makes much sense and that's the, the number of messages visible. Um, so if that number, so that's the, the metric that you want to monitor. If um, number of messages visible goes uh, above zero, you have to alert your team and then you have to go and fix something. Uh, so that's important. Otherwise, you will just have lots of messages in your dead letter queue, but no one is noticing. So definitely monitor that queue. Um, okay, so let's inspect um, the, the messages just to get a quick idea of how this looks like. Um, so we pull for messages here and then we look at one. So how does it look like? And this is really like the CloudWatch event itself. So it looks exactly the same as what you get when you uh, connect the Lambda function to CloudWatch events, for example. So it's it's just in an SQS queue now. So one question that I ask myself is, okay, now I have here uh, six messages in the dead letter queue. How do I ever get them back into um, EventBridge, for example? And the answer here is that what AWS suggests is you create a Lambda function and subscribe that Lambda function to the dead letter queue. And then in this case, um, make a call to EventBridge again to put the event back into EventBridge. So that's kind of what you have to do. You don't have to care much about uh, reading from the queue because that will be done by Lambda. The Lambda function will only make sure to put that event back into EventBridge. So that's um, the option that you have here. Okay, so I was running into one issue with that. Um, when I first used that feature, I had set it up my dead letter queue and I created a Lambda function that fades from time to time. And I wasn't seeing any messages in this dead letter queue. So I was curious what's going on. It turns out that EventBridge invokes a Lambda function in an asynchronous way, which means EventBridge doesn't care if your Lambda function actually runs or not. So if your code executes or not. In my case, I was happily throwing an exception but EventBridge doesn't care. So what kicks in is that in Lambda functions, an asynchronous invocation is automatically retried two times. And then the invocation is kind of um, chopped. So if you are interested in those kinds of problems, you have to create a dead letter queue for your Lambda function. So that's a different Lambda, a different dead letter queue, and it kicks in for different kinds of events. And that can go wrong. So basically you need both of them. So what I did is I configured my Lambda function to actually put something in that it let a queue as well if things go wrong. So I created another queue and here um, I have, uh, let me look into the messages. I have another um, message and it is again the same kind of format because that's exactly the uh, input into the lambda function as well but this time it was captured from the lambda service because lambda was actually like the the function itself was actually failing so that's really something that you should watch out for if you set this up you don't need a single dead letter queue in event bridge no you also need in that letter queue in lambda and that depends on the kind of target type so it 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 applies for Lambda functions, it might not apply to other services because Lambda has its own retry mechanism for asynchronous invocations only. So keep that in mind. Okay, um, back to um, the slides. So this is uh, just what I told you in a couple of uh, the last minutes here. Lambda retries as well, so keep that in mind. You need two dead letter queues. Okay, um, it's time for the next and the last demo. So this is where I demonstrate replay in archival. So let's look at that. So what I have here is um, a DynamoDB table where I store um, 
for all the events I store an item in the table. So let's look at that very quickly. What I do is for every event I store um, the timestamp as the ID in this table and the random value as value here. And random values are values between um, 0 and 1 as you can see. Uh, so there's no value that's actually bigger than, than that. So that's fine. Okay. So what I'm now going to do is I want to introduce um, a change because actually this was a mistake. The, the value should be a number between um, 0 and 100. So I never should store that in the database. So what can I do now? With event replay, that's actually now possible. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change my code. Then I will update the Lambda function that listens to those events. And then I'm going to replay all of the events. The code change is deployed. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to trigger um, the replay. Before I do that, I show you how archiving works. So first you create a archive. Um, and if you create such an archive, you also specify the event bus. And you could also make only subscribe to certain events from certain rules, or you can just catch all the, um, the events. And you can also define a retention period. So you could have infinite retention if you like, but you can also restrict it. For example, I restricted it to 90 days. So that's great. So now let's start the replay. So what I'm going to do is um, I enter a name here. I call it cloud and out. Um, the source is um, the archive itself and it goes to the cloud and out event bus uh, for all the rules. And I start at today's date at exactly zero o'clock. Um, so what you could do here is like, if you know the deployment time of your bad change, then actually that would be um, a better like start time, like a couple of seconds before your deployment, for example. And I will end this replay at um, uh, maybe uh, the current time. So that's uh, my local time here. So that's it, that's all you need to enter and then you can start the replay. So replaying does not kick in immediately. So the status first goes into starting and then it takes a couple of, uh, usually I think I observed around one minute until it really starts to replay the events. Um, so that's again something where you have to be a little bit patient. So let's wait for that. So great, the status now changed to running, which means that now um, events are actually replayed. So. If I look at my database, what I expect is that um, I, I see, and I already see a couple of values here that are um, like um, increased already. And as you can see, there are still some values who are below one. Um, and, and that's the reason because events are replayed, uh, like not all at once actually. So it takes some time until all of them are replayed. So for during the replay time, you will see old and new values, but um, the longer this takes, the better it gets. Um, so um, because the events will all be replayed at some point in time. So that's pretty cool. And I like that feature um, in scenarios where you do deployments and when your like code actually corrupts the data because you uh, just write something to the database that shouldn't be in the database. Uh, so you could just reapply uh, all these events. But this has a couple of uh, like things you should consider. Your code has to be idempotent because you will actually execute it multiple times. And in my opinion, it has to be idempotent anyway, not only because of replay, replays, because of the at least once delivery guarantees. So if you use it uh, the way it is intended to be used, you are fine here. The other thing to consider is that some operations actually cannot be made idempotent. For example, sending out emails, also things like making, um, um, like calling out to third parties, for example, making a credit card transaction or uh, things like that, very likely not um, possible to implement it in an idempotent way. So then event replays can actually cause lots of problems. So you have to be um, a little bit careful when actually replaying events uh, to make sure that the code can deal with it. Uh, so in this case, it's pretty simple. I just update my DynamoDB table. So that is fine to rerun the event. Uh, but in other cases, it could be a little bit more tricky. So let's just reload that page here and let's see, okay, now it looks pretty good. Okay, there's still some values not uh, updated. Uh, so let's switch to event bridge. I guess it's still running, yeah. But I mean, that just takes some time and, and after it's done, you will see all the events will be replayed. So one important thing to um, realize here is that 
the order of events during a replay is not the same as you ingested them into the event bus. So it's kind of random and it is definitely more random than what you observe when the system is running in normal mode. So if you're not replaying. Um, so it is completely crazy order as you already saw in my DynamoDB table. I mean, there are some chunks that are already updated and there are some missing ones. And then again, there are some uh, already updated. So it's completely random. So that's what I observe. So that's something you have to take uh, into account. Um, I mean, again, it's not, if you use event bridge the way it is intended to be used, which means you don't rely on order because the service doesn't guarantee it, then this will not cause problems. But if you kind of rely on order and hope that it works and then you get big problems with replays. So keep that in mind. So that's it. And um, this was a very quick recap of the latest features of event bridge, a service that becomes more and more powerful uh, and it is now um, a good option also compared to SNS. And if you're interested in the differences, check out the blog post uh, where I compare event bridge with SNS. Um, so that's really interesting. So SNS is not the only option that we have. So event bridge is really getting uh, interesting as well. And with the archival and replay functionality, it actually has advantages over SNS in certain situations. So check that out. Uh, if you have any questions or if you have any feedback for us, then please let us know in the community where you can discuss this video and also other topics. So thanks for watching. We will see us again in a week. Bye.